time for Adrian Griffiths of uh, Recycling Technologies. Welcome to EcoSummit. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, in 2010, I was asked by Warwick University to actually uh, take a look at a pyrolysis process that they were uh, working with on mixed plastic waste. Um, sadly, since then, my children tell me that uh, all I ever do now is talk rubbish. Um, it is interesting to just stop and think a little bit, though, about uh, what actually happens to, to our rubbish. Uh, and, and I want to talk particularly about plastic. Because across the Europe, 46 million tons of plastic enters, uh, enters life. Um, I have to say that as a dweller of planet Earth, I was fairly horrified when you start digging to find out that uh, only 14% of that gets recycled um, across Europe. Um, there's about 19% or 8.9 million tons goes to energy from waste. But the rest, well, I think the picture probably sums it up. You know, you have this perception in your mind, and certainly when I was asked to look at this as, a, as an opportunity to commercialize the technology, you have an impression that you put your stuff into your, your wheelie bin or to a, uh, some sort of vessel outside your house, somebody comes and takes it along uh, away, and, uh, and it all gets reprocessed. But of course, the, the reality is very far short of the, um, the PR, if you like. Um, and it's not just a commercial issue. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever uh, Googled plastic oceans or looked at any of the films that are now emerging uh, of the amount of plastic which is actually building up in the oceans. I'm told that now by the uh, American um, uh, Marine Institute that you can't put a bucket into the Pacific and actually pull it out without pulling out shards of plastic at any point in the Pacific. And when you stop and think about that, then that's fairly horrific. I mean, as the picture here shows, that's a zooplankton. That's how you got shards of plastic in it. That's getting eaten by the fish, and that's actually getting into the food chain. And, uh, and plastic is an absorber of the background pollution, sometimes a million times more pollution actually in a shard of plastic than in the background ocean. And so this is not just a, a commercial problem, and it's not just a problem that we can bury out of sight. The, the problem of plastic is, uh, is a very real one. And it's a growing one. And this is a, a graph done by Plastics Europe, and I think it's just absolutely amazing just to see the rise and the rise and the rise of, of plastic. Um, the only little dips that you ever see in that obviously line up with various uh, large recessions. Um, but, you know, plastic, uh, is, it's a fantastic material. And so it's going to continue to, to grow, and so a solution needs to be found for the end of plastic waste. Now, there's some very uh, significant drivers for change in this, and I'm very glad about that. Um, you know, people do recognize that there's a problem, and people want to do something about it, uh, and that includes governments. And so if I just speak of the UK for a moment, um, there is this thing called the landfill tax, which has gone up at a very steep kind of curve. Um, and, and it's basically caused a, a huge ripple to go through the, the waste industry. I often call it the blade of the bulldozer. Um, and, and people are sort of scattering before it, and everybody's coming up with different ways of trying to deal with waste. But the good thing is, is that there is a mood for change. Um, there's a public desire for change. It's interesting that if you can't actually stamp recyclable on your carton, uh, then a lot of the supermarkets, they won't put it on the shelves. And so there, there is end of uh, producer responsibility, uh, and people recognize that the public want change, uh, and the whole concept of the circular economy is driving quite a, uh, aggressively forward. And of course, too, there are things like energy security. Plastic kilo for kilo is a, a, a calorific value of a very, very good coal. It's better as a good as anthracite. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in, the, in this country alone, there's 200 million tons of plastic buried in landfills. And you think, crumbs, if that was coal, there'd be a few boys out with the shovels, and, uh, and, and I know about that because I come from Wales. And so what's the solution? So what we came up with was uh, the Warwick FBR, just in uh, recognizing where the uh, technology originally uh, was seeded, if you like, where the original idea came from. And so what we've devised here is actually a, a, a containerized system. Uh, the first container that you see is, is actually taking in plastic waste. Um, and, and it's a very, very standard technology that you'd find in any uh, mixed recycling facility or any waste sort of facility. Just simply shredding the plastic, uh, we're drying it, we're taking out the, uh, um, you know, the, the stones and the glass and the, and the metal that shouldn't be there. Um, and, and then we put it into the second module. 
Um, and we use a process called pyrolysis. A lot of you will be aware of pyrolysis, but we're simply just heating the plastic to about 500 degrees in the absence of oxygen. No oxygen, it doesn't burn, but it goes through the process, if you remember your chemistry uh, days at school, uh, of thermal cracking. And so these long polymer chains are actually chopped up into shorter little pieces, uh, and, and they turn into things which are very reminiscent of what you might find in diesel. Um, now, the problem, of course, with plastic is it has lots of contamination in it. If you have PVC, you have chlorine in it. If you have your non-stick surfaces, it's PTFE, it has fluorine in it. You know, there are fire retardants in it, there are fillers in it, there are all sorts of pigmentation um, issues in it, and heavy metals that get put in, which make life quite interesting. And so, actually, the, uh, um, the next part of the process, after we've turned it from a, a solid to a, to a hot gas, is to then take out all of these uh, contamination uh, in a hot gas filtration system and a few other chemical processes. They're not completely novel processes at all. Um, they, they are uh, essentially a Meccano set, if you like, of, of industrial processes brought together for a specific purpose at a specific size. And then once we've cleaned this hot gas up, we condense it back down and it forms a, a fuel or a product, really. It's a, it, we call it platsoil, to give it a name. It's, it's a waxy material, and hence plastic and wax, and so platsoil. Um, and, and, and that can be used now for multiple purposes. But the way we like to see it is, is that plastic started life as oil. It's been used as a plastic, and it has some significant benefits in carbon reduction on that. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and, and we return it back to essentially a, a, a crude oil, if you like. And so the, the, the thing I was just mentioning there about carbon reduction is a, a lot of people say, well, you've got to reduce the amount of plastic they use on food packaging for uh, um, obvious reasons. But it's not that obvious because you reduce it and you actually get more food wastage. Food is actually a hugely carbon intensive thing to actually produce. And so actually the amount of carbon that you actually lose in, the, in, in producing additional food because of the food that you've lost because you didn't want to use the plastic is far, far more than the, what you actually use in the, in the plastic. And so if, well, the problem really is, what do you do about plastic at its end of life? We think we've solved that problem. And, and we think that this solution, which is modular, so it can be built fairly cheaply, you take it to where the problem is, rather than transporting um, a, a waste product over large distances, as we very often do these days. Um, and and it, for us, we think it's the highest return on investment of any solution for end-of-waste plastic. So the sort of numbers that you might see in here, uh, um, the, the, the typical unit that we're envisaging, uh, it would be taking 7,000 tons of plastic a year. Uh, that produces just over 5,000 tons of oil. Um, there are gate fees. Uh, the, even if you just take the, the landfill tax in the UK, this is a very UK-centric uh, set of numbers for a moment, uh, but, but they, they do stack up uh, pretty broadly. Um, and, and then you look at the value of the oil at about £420 a tonne. Um, there are lots of uses for this oil which could, could be considerably greater than that. But just to put a, a reasonable number on it for a moment, that means that you've got a machine which will sell for £3.5 which will give you an EBITR of about 2.25 million. And so even if you called it two, you've still got a very good payback. And so hopefully this is actually going to be a force for good because it, it fuses a, a commercial benefit with a, with a, a great environmental uh, outcome. Clearly, obviously, uh, when you've got numbers like that, then uh, we think we can sell quite a lot of these machines. Um, we think in a stable stage that we'd probably get to about 100 of these per annum, um, 3.5 million per piece, um, you can do the, the maths. So uh, where does it fit in the existing chain? And so if you take your, your wheelie bin, um, you know, plastic or, or, or a, uh, material uh, reclamation is about sorting. And so people just take the, the wood and they take the cardboard and they keep, they keep taking bits out of the stream. Now, at this point in time, people take out PET and, uh, and HDPE, those are two bottles that you can see behind me. Um, and, and then the, the stuff that's left at the end is typically, certainly in this country, and in most countries around Europe, bar, and here we go, Germany, well done, Germany, and, and Switzerland and Sweden, and, and what I would call the grown-up nations, if you like, that have taken a fairly long-term view about capital, um, th that material would tend to go to an incinerator and, and, and be burned to recover its energy. 
What we envisage is that uh, uh, material can be taken to biomass, uh, and that can be turned in, uh, used for its energy, if you like. But we're interested in the plastic that falls out at the end of that process. We're not trying to compete with the recycling of bottles. If you can do that, great, fantastic. But the stuff that doesn't get recycled, that normally goes to landfill or incineration, that's the stuff that we're after to, to turn it back into oil. Um, just to sort of uh, show that you know, we're not all as a I I alien uh, from uh, Eco Machines has uh, invested in the company. And he says what well, people like to see when they look at the photographs is you're not all 12. Well, I can assure you we're not all 12. You know, there's enough gray hair and lack of hair to actually show that there's a few sort of uh, um, laps around the block being done by the team. You know, people like Adrian Harworth, he was a, a really um, uh, energetic sort of guy, spent 30 odd years in GE, um, was very senior in GE Energy, and uh, he's going for world domination. Somebody said earlier that GE always had money, it was just a question of finding the ideas to invest in. But we just haven't quite calmed Adrian Harworth down yet to realize that we haven't got GE kind of resources. But it's great to see the uh, enthusiasm. As you'd expect, there's a whole uh, bunch of uh, advisors which actually go with this as well to, to make sure that we're actually on the, on the straight and narrow. And we really appreciate some of the, uh, the leading experts in the uh, world of fluidized bed technology and, uh, and, and waste. Peter Jones, OBE, 30 years at Biffa, very well experienced guy. But really, these are the people that make it happen. We have a great team, and we're very pleased with them. We're just building a, the first uh, commercial machine in, in Swindon Council, um, which will be uh, going into place early next year. And so that is us. I can tell you, you want me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Good. A little over time, a little bit. Okay. okay, do we have a question by Adrian? Ben? Thanks very much. Um, this fuel is going to be used in CHP engines and things like that. Is that right? Or uh, I guess my question is, um, what sort of validation have you done on the properties of that fuel and compatibility with uh, you know, what it's actually going to be used for? Thank you. Sure. Um, I mean, initially, the fuel can actually be sold back to um, oil reprocessors, such as our last speaker. Um, there are a number of companies which actually take oil back into the oil chain uh, and that turns back into lubrication oil or it can be turned back into plastic or it's, it's feedstock um, uh, in, the, in the true sense. Um, we recognize that it can actually be used directly in engines uh, and we've run it in engines and proven that that's, uh, that is the case. Um, we're currently doing, a, we've got a grant from DEC to actually put a, a much bigger test bed in place and do that over many, many more hours. But uh, yeah, it's this very useful um, and multifunctional fuel. All right. Adrian, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you.